My name is Henry Lennon and this is my 24 on river fishing. Now you may be wondering why I'm starting my 24 in the dark. And it's a good question, but I've got a good answer. It's because we are moments away from the glorious June the 16th. And those of you who know anything about river fishing will know that's when the river season starts. And there's a bit of a tradition uh, that I've certainly followed in recent years and that is to get the rods out on the stroke of midnight as soon as that river season starts. And I thought it would make perfect sense to do this my 24. So we're gonna be fishing midnight to midnight. So I'm gonna get these rods ready in preparation for when that clock strikes 12 and the river season starts again for the year. Well, it's just gone midnight, and that means my 24 starts now. And to celebrate the river season, starting again, I'm gonna swap out this timer for a bottle of champagne provided by Brad. A little drink for the river, give us a good look for the session and the season ahead. A little drink for me. <laughs> Let's get the rods out, get fishing. When you get down there on June the 15th as well, you're with your mate, you're getting everything ready. Uh, that buzz is really there as you tying on your leaders, putting on hook baits, everything's sat there ready to be cast out at midnight. You're chatting around, around a fire, around a meal, around a takeaway, whatever, as, as you build up to that midnight. And you, you really feel it building inside you. You're getting excited and just thinking about what the season can bring ahead. I love it. I think it's, um, it's, it's a special day, it's a special feeling that you don't get in a, in a lot of other forms of angling. That's it, June the 16th, the river season has started. Rods are out, they went out perfectly. Two rods on this side of the lock gate, one side on this side of the lock gate, so spreading my bets. For now, I'm gonna head over to the sleep system, chill out, soak in the atmosphere, and have a glass of that champagne. So we got the rods out that evening and uh, very quickly we caught a bream. The rest of the night passed uneventfully and I won't lie, I was pretty good when I woke up in the morning. I really thought we were gonna catch one. After what I'd seen in the weeks leading up to the session when I'd gone down there, I thought there was no way I wasn't gonna catch in that first night. So when dawn broke and then the sun started getting pretty high, and I hadn't had anything, I was really thinking that it was massive opportunity blown. You always, if you've ever fished June 16th yourself and you've done a pre-baiting campaign leading up to it, you'll know how, how I felt at this point. You almost feel like the fish know it's June the 16th. It's like they've got their own calendar. They go, okay, river season starts now, time to be on your guard because building up the session, I'd seen carp there all the time. Sometimes I'd go down for five minutes to bait up and I'd see 10 fish. And I hadn't seen any carp at this point in this session and I woke up to motionless sirens and feeling pretty despondent. I've just seen one carp cruising about the area, so there's a chance. Normally I'd want to get up and move, but I'm making myself stay on my spots a bit longer this year. I don't want to be chasing the fish around. I want to they move around so much, river carp, they're so nomadic, and I'm sort of waiting for them to come to us. So I'm gonna sit on my hands, probably walk up and down this towpath, see if I can see any signs, just so I don't get so 
itchy feet that I need to reel in and hope and pray that we get on this morning because it's going to be scolding today. I think that the middle of the day is going to be a difficult period to get a bike. So with every passing minute, the chance of a bike for me are looking less and less likely. But there's still a chance, there's definitely still a chance. Around eight o'clock, I did see the odd fish moving through the area that had come down from that private stretch and were ghosting around my spots. I'd actually seen one rock up on my right hand spot and move off. So I walked down along the bridge to look at my left hand spot. And as I was there, there was a carp feeding and then one of my alarms ripped off. And I won't lie, I thought it was the left hand rod where I'd just seen the fish feeding. So as I ran around in my, my spot underneath the bush, it was that rod that had gone off. I was a little bit surprised, but I was not at all disappointed because I was into my first river carp of the season. He's just gone down the path there and he's looking at uh, a piece of fish feed and he's made to move the rod. Um, one down here where I literally just said to Curly I'd seen one as well. Seems like this early morning is quite prolific. <laughs> that one busted off. Uh, And that, boys, is a river carp. Yes! Oh, get in there. I reckon that could have been the one that I'd just seen there about <laughs> half an hour ago. So it just tipped up on the spot. So it seemed like it drifted off up there, and I walked down and saw a couple of, on that uh, spit where my other rod is. So I thought if one was going to go, it would have been my left-hander, but it was my right-hander. Not that I'm complaining. And we've got a June the 16th carp. Get in there. biggest fish in the world but that's not why I fish the rivers. Fishing for the freedom, the adventure and for catching really cool ones just like this. I've just gone down, down the path away from my spot, just checking my left-handed rod. I saw a few fish over there then here my rod's going. And to be honest I thought it was that left-hand rod but it wasn't. It's my right-hand rod under the bush here. And on the end was this to kickstart my season, kickstart the session. I'm over the moon. All that pre-bait on that spot had been worthwhile because like I said, I was just doing that one night on that spot. I was then going to move off because of how pressured that spot becomes. So it was it was now or never basically for, for the first spot. I wasn't going to go back to it. So it was nice to have, have caught something from there. Well, after that bream and the fact that the sun's got so warm, I don't think it's going to happen here. However, I do have a spot not too far away that I have been pre-baiting that I pre-baited thinking that it could be quite a good spot if the weather was like it is today. So we're going to head there now. For me, the biggest edge on the river is pre-baiting without a shadow of a doubt. Um, but it's no good just rocking up on the river and throwing bait in the first bit of water you see and hoping the fish turn up. Kevin has always said to me, and he's definitely right that you can't make a carp go where it doesn't want to be and he's he's so true if a carp doesn't want to be somewhere be this on a lake or a river no matter how much bait you put in that they're, they're just not going to show up for for 95 percent of the time so what you need to do is you need to find where they like to be naturally i refer to areas in the river as either holding areas or passing areas you need to find holding areas these are the areas where normally there's a bit of structure but be that man-made or natural there might be some sort of bend in the river where the flow collects, which means food collects there, or the water might be a little bit deeper or shallower. There's something there that the fish like naturally, and that's why they like to hang out there. If you can find those areas and bait them, then that's when you have a successful spot to fish. Passing areas are just areas where the fish move through on their way to different holding areas. Normally it's just a straight stretch of, of river, and sometimes you'll see quite a few fish going through and you think, 
wow, this could be the spot that I, I'm going to fish because there's fish ghosting over all the time. But they're just, they're moving, they're treating that as a road. They're not stopping there to feed. And you may occasionally nick a bite if you, if you see fish there at that time, you put a little handful of bait out and a rod and you might just nick them. But in terms of the carp going there regularly to feed heavily, these passing areas aren't the ones. So you need to find a holding area for the target with that pre-bait. Well, we've just arrived at the second spot of the day. And the reason I want to fish here is because of that snaggy margin. The sun is beating down on us now. It's very hot. And I think the fish are going to feel quite uncomfortable. They want a bit of shade and that tree margin, I know from past experience, they like to get in there when it's a hot day like this and I've been pre-baiting it. So it makes perfect sense to come here now. I actually, when we arrived, walked about hundred meters further down and nearly had an opportunity to catch one off the top. However, the weed rakes came through and spooked the carp away. Um, very nice of the weed rakes to decide to come out on opening day of the season. It's almost like they planned it. Who would have thought it? Anyway, going to get the rods out now. Two rods on that far margin. We keep a third rod in reserve in case I see one to drop on as a bit of an opportunist uh, approach. For now, the time is 13 hours, 20 minutes left on the clock. Going to get the rods out. I think we're going to catch one. I'm going to call it before dark. Efficient angling. It was really hot and walking up and down, trying to find an opportunity was, was hard work. On top of that, you've got three, four cameramen in tow and the fish had been really wary and it just felt like it wasn't gonna happen unless that perfect opportunity presented itself. The heat got to the cameramen a bit, a little bit and they thought I was fighting a losing battle. So they sort of sat down in the shade next to, next to my bottom bait rods. And it was just me going up and down, trying to find the opportunity. Sometimes you see one fish come up, it might take one bit of bread and then move off again. And I was waiting just to find that fish that, I could, that looked slightly catchable, that I could intercept with a little bit of bread. And after about two, three hours of doing this, the opportunity presented itself. Okay, you keep an eye on that for me, please, but I'm gonna get my rod real quick. I got that bread flake just in front of its, its swimming path and it came up and very reluctantly took the bread. I saw that white disappear down its mouth, struck, and I was into my second cart of the session. Oh, it's finally happened. I've been up and down this towpath for the past two hours in this sun. The fish, have, they're so weird for, for river carp. They're very precious, especially when you consider it's June 16th. They're just coming up, taking the odd one, moving away again. So really, I've, I found a pair. I was just trying to leapfrog them, intercept them, get a bit of crust in front of them. And uh, that's what I did. And it worked an absolute treat. Got a very nice, common on the end. Nearly got run over by the boat just then. Unfortunately, I think this is the slightly smaller of the two, but after how much effort's gone into this, I'm really not complaining. And it is in the net, yes. Oh, I've worked hard for that one. Oh, sick. Happy days. In the summer as well, don't neglect that free lining setup. You need to be bringing that flow rod with you because there's plenty of opportunities where you'll see carp cruising with their noses up. Maybe they're just sat in the water's um, flow, like, like you see chub doing. And if you get a bit of bread drifting over the head, they're going to take it. So make sure you stick one of them on the barrel when you're going around because the opportunity might be there. And if you've not got that rod with you, you're going to be a bit annoyed. Again, I was so happy because it meant that all that effort was worthwhile. And although I sat there sweating, probably got sunburned, just needed a drink of water. Everything felt amazing because I'd caught another carp and off the top as well from the river. For me, that's, that's the perfect way to catch a carp because it's from that freeing, adventurous, wild environment and I'm sight fishing for them. That my two favorite things are two things I look for most in my angling and I got it right there on June the 16th. So yeah, pretty special moment.
This is my 60 second top tip and it all revolves around reading the flow of the river. There's going to be those natural collection areas in the river where the food items that are drifting through the current want to collect. This is where the carp are going to target. It's almost like a natural pre-baiting point and they're going to be areas of the river that the carp head to when they're hungry. You want to try and find these areas and you can do so by placing a pop-up in the river and watching the way it travels down the river. This is going to mimic the way food items move in the flow and it's going to lead you to those holding areas. Watch where it goes, watch where it eventually ends up and basically gets held up in sort of like a backwater, a bit, little bit of an eddy maybe. These are going to be those collection points that the river carp are going to target when they're hungry. A lot of people can find rigs when they're river fishing quite confusing, but they don't really need to be super different to what you'd use in your normal angling on a lake. I use a slip D for my bottom boat fishing on a lake and I do the same on a river just with a few minor alterations to account for the environment I'm fishing in. First and foremost, it's important to use a stiff hook link. I use 20 pound stiff skin link, usually in black because that's the coloration that I find matches most river beds. The reason you need a stiff hook link is because one, you're likely to get picked up a lot by nuisance fish such as bream, tench or chub. These will live in the river and there's a lot of the time they're gonna suck in your hook bait, not suck in the hook and you're gonna get a bite, but they're gonna bring the rig into play and you need to have a stiff hook link so it gets reset every single time. Another reason is that flow. It's not too bad on the, on the river we're fishing today, but if the flow is quite severe, you want a nice stiff hook link so it, everything kicks away nicely from the lead. With that being said, I'm not a big fan of having a stiff coating all the way through. I don't think it aids reef mechanics very well. I like to have a nice simple section around the hook eye because I believe that this helps the hook fly back into the fish's mouth and gives you better hook holes. Therefore, I strip a little bit back, maybe about an inch, an inch and a half from the hook eye. I also like to put a bit of tungsten putty. In this case, I've used a slider because I just think it's a little bit neater, but you can use putty. But also that weight there, when the fish sucks in the bay, it's gonna help drive down that hook point into its bottom lip. Another very important alteration that I make when compared to my normal slip D is the actual hook pattern I use. For my normal slip D, when I fish in lakes, I love a twister. However, you can't get away with that straight point on a river because in the flow, that hook is being battered around on nice little bits of gravel and that can dink a straight point. By using that curve point, you've got a little bit more protection from that flow and it means you're fishing more effectively with a sharper hook for longer. The final point that I want to highlight is the hook bait. Like I said already, the river is plagued with nuisance fish. You've seen already, I've had a couple of bream and that could be a lot worse if I was using 12 mil wafter, 15 mil standard bottom bait. Right now I'm fishing with an 18 mil cultured bottom bait and a 15 mil pop-up as a snowman. If I was really getting pestered by the bream, I've not been too bad this session, but there's been times when I've been fishing the river, but a shoal move over me. Within five minutes of putting the rig out, I'm getting another bite from a bream. In circumstances like this, I'll go up to a 20 mil and a 15 mil pop-up, or maybe even a 24 mil and an 80 mil pop-up to try and deal with the annoyance of bream, chub, nuisance fish like this that you find in the river. I love the cultured bottom bait. They've got that, that hard, normal boily inner center and a nice paste around it. With the flow, when that paste dissolves, it's trickling downstream and helping bring fish upstream onto your bait. Even if you maybe you've been wiped out and you've got no bait left, but that paste is still dissolving, it means you've still got extra scent around your hook bait. Finally, my pop-ups. You may notice my pop-ups look a little bit weird they're all in uh, they're all sorted colors in one old battered pot all together and there's a reason for this what i normally do is at the start of the season is i'll buy loads of different colors of pop-ups and i'll mix them all together so i've got sort of five six pots of assorted colors i'll pour in a load of scopic squid liquid bake soap give it a good shake and i'll almost let it cure over sort of six seven months so that that liquid is really soaked into the pop-up this is the rig that I use for my snag fishing. I'm fishing the big canals over in Europe and for river fishing. It's a go-to for me now. I've got so much confidence in it. It's a slight variation on that classic slip D that has caught thousands, if not millions of carp. And there's just those little tweaks to make it river friendly. And it means that I'm fishing effectively in the river for as long as possible. Uh, I went and sat back down with the boys in the shade. Uh, we did the fish, talking about what my plan was next, whether I was gonna move again. And although I had another spot baited that I was thinking of doing the night on, 
with the number of fish I'd seen in the area, okay, they were looking a little bit wary, they weren't looking at that moment catchable. I thought as the evening started to come and they sort of settled down a little bit, we had a very good chance of catching one. So I wanted to stay put. And as that sun started to dip, everything started to cool down a little bit. Uh, I had an absolute screamer of a run and I was doing battle with my third fish of June the 16th. Evening, sun's just starting to set. That unbearable heat is just starting to get bearable again. And we've had an absolute mower, typical of a river carp. Even if they're not the biggest fish in the world, they put up an incredible scrap. And that bite certainly showcased that. I'm trying to maneuver him around these lilies down here now. I think he's more or less done. And he is in the net. Number three of the session. Oh. Perfect time, I've just started to think, why haven't I had a bite off this rod, off these rods yet? It seemed absolutely perfect for it. The weather was spot on, almost getting a little bit worried that I wasn't presented. I think I was. For me, it's always about just catching one and doing this. It's not about having this mega session because sadly, a lot of the time it, it can be a bit anticlimactic. You've been building up to this day for so long and then it arrives and it's not quite been built up to what you'd pictured in your head it could be. On this occasion it had, I'd, I'd caught a, a number of fish in various different ways and it'd been really enjoyable. And that makes number three of what has been probably my best ever June the 16th. Bit of a battered old one, got a bit of spawn damage which we'll fix up with some carp care afterwards. I've got absolutely no complaints how this session's gone. Normally for June the 16th, I just want to get off the mark. So the fact that I've had three already and we've still got time to go means that has been a proper, proper good session. I'm slipping back now. Now that we've had quite a few, I'm really hoping we can get a bit of a bigger one. A 20 pounder would be the ice on the cake, but it's already been my most memorable June the 16th. Your, your, river, your river fishing journey, much like any journey carp fishing will be a development and this is probably my third year where I've seriously targeted the rivers and I'd say that this, it, I'm saying this off the back of a successful opening day, but it feel like this year I've, I'm, I'm much more confident in the approach I'm going for. In the past I've, I've been chasing my tail, trying to find the carp, trying to, trying to find them where they are at that exact moment and get rigs in front of them, but now I'm, I'm happy with the approach I have on the river and it, now it's a case of being consistent with what I'm doing keeping that bait going in on the spot, and I think I'm gonna feel the rewards for it this year. You will probably experience the same thing. Maybe you, the first year, two, three years, you find the challenge to be not offering you the rewards you think it should be for the effort you're putting in. But just like any facet of carp fishing, just like any facet of life, you will take time to figure out what works best, not just for for that style of angling, but for, for yourself as well. And um, I feel like this session has proved to me that I've not got it figured out, you've never got it figured out, but I've got uh, the foundations now sorted in my head for what, what helps make a successful session. So I was very happy with how things went this session. I don't think I would have changed my approach at all, to be honest. Um, things went well for once uh, on opening day and um, I'm happy with how things turned out. It is now June the 17th and the opening day of the river season is over. I am delighted with how things have gone. I normally aim for just one fish to kickstart the season. So to have three in front of the cameras has been fantastic. I know that we're spending more than just this opening day on the rivers this season. I'm really looking forward to how they're gonna unfold for me. And if you're on your own adventures on the river this season, I wish you the very best of luck. <laughs>